Big news. Earlier this month, when astronomers announced they'd spotted another interstellar object, that's an object from another star system caught moving within our own solar system. It's only the third one ever discovered. And in just two short weeks since that July 1st discovery, astronomers have learned that this star traveler might be the oldest comet we've ever seen. And here to talk to us today is University of Oxford astronomer Matthew Hopkins, who is the author, one of the, the lead author of the new study about this object. Matthew, hello. Hello. <laughs> It's so it's so great to have you here. So uh, I have so many questions about this object. And did I describe interstellar right? Yes, yeah, it very much is. Uh, it formed around another star, another solar system, but early on in its life got ejected and it's been wandering the galaxy ever since. Awesome, and so why does it carry the name? So we've given it a name, 3i Atlas, and. Explain that name to us. So the way we name interstellar objects was only decided back in 2017 when we found the first one. We had to scramble slightly to come up with a way to refer to them. Uh, so it's, it's done incrementally in number. So the first one was 1i, second one 2i, this one's 3i. And each gets a kind of uh, a, a name as well as a designation. Uh, so you had umuamua, a Hawaiian word meaning kind of distant traveler for the first one. Then the second two being comets have been named after their discoverers. 2i was Borisov, because there's a Crimean ast astronomer out there who found it. And uh, this is Atlas, named after the big survey uh, and series of telescopes that in which it was discovered. Okay, so tell us about that. So this, let me show a different picture. This, this uh, is the actual object moving through space. And the track is short because we haven't, been observing it for very long, right? Yeah. Uh, so tell us how it was discovered, like it was discovered by a survey telescope? Yeah, so ATLAS is this network of multiple different telescopes across Hawaii and Chile, which constantly scans the sky. Its main purpose is actually finding near-Earth asteroids that might put the Earth in danger, but don't worry, 3 is not coming anywhere near us. We don't need to worry about that. <laughs> they image the sky every night, and then can look for moving objects. They look for new points of light and things that are moving between night between nights and try and fit orbits to them. And this one, when they fit an orbit, they realize it must have come from outside the solar system. Wow. And so your press release said that you analyzed the comet using a statistical method. And tell us about that. How how did you study the comet? So I spent the last four years of my PhD uh, predicting what the population of interstellar objects looks like and mainly looking at their velocities. Um, we can tell a lot from just the velocity of an object because when we look at stars in the local, like around the sun, there are, strong, there are correlations between their velocities and their other properties, such as their composition and importantly for 3i, their age. Older objects have uh, velocities that mean they're on orbits around the galactic center that take them up and down out of the plane of the disk. And 3i is one, one of these orbit objects that has, one of, the, one of these orbits that takes it quite far away from the disk. And that means that it's old. Okay, so our Milky Way galaxy is a flat disk. Actually, I have a picture of that. Let me, let me find that. This one. So the Milky yeah. Way galaxy is a flat disk. Uh, it's a little warped, as you can see. That's just been recently discovered that our galaxy is warped. And so this object's orbit takes it up and down through that disk? Yeah, this is a side view that it's going around the galactic center, but it goes up and down as it does so. Uh, and you can kind of see the red line takes it reasonably far out. That's the orbit of 3i. In yellow is the sun's orbit. So you can see that although it oscillates a bit up and down as well, it's much more constrained to the center of the disk. Yeah, and so you have to look kind of closely to see that that yellow line, which is our sun's orbit, is actually inside the orbit, the red line. So the <clears throat> so the so three i is going like this, whereas the sun is just moving along in yeah, the yeah. disk of the galaxy. Cool. That's so cool. So so what else? What else did you find out? 
So also by looking at its velocity, stars that have similar orbits and similar velocities that are generally low metallicity, that means that they've got an elemental composition which has a lot more just pure hydrogen and helium, whereas higher metallicity stars like the sun have more other things like oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and the stuff that you make planets and people out of. Right. And so our our star is is at least a second generation star because it's got those what astronomers call metals. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and 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 so we know that our sun, uh, that the stuff inside the sun was born in a supernova explosion. Right. Mm. Yes. Uh, by looking at very specific elements, there's an idea that maybe there was a supernova very early, uh, very not very long before the sun formed very nearby and it picked up an interesting elemental composition from that. But overall, generally over time, the galaxy enriches as well. But are you saying that by by looking at the velocity of 3i Atlas, that you know that it matches a population of stars that's low in metals? Yeah. Is that the uh, idea? We can, there's, there's a correlation there. It's not like we can match it to a certain exact population or a certain exact star. But right. we know that other stars with a very similar orbit to it, from one of which it probably came from, uh, generally have lower metallicities than most stars in the galaxy. So let's talk about the thick disk of the galaxy, because that's a term I don't hear very often. So we think about the Milky Way as being this flat plane. But here's an illustration of uh, the plane of the galaxy as we think of it, which is, uh, I think, the black part here, the thin disk stars like our sun, but then there's also this thick disk, and that's probably the origin of uh, 3i Atlas, right? Maybe. This is actually something that we're still debating. Uh, the boundary between the thick disk and thin disk is kind of fuzzy, and it's kind of close, but we do know that there's a continuous increase in age of stars as you go into these more oscillating orbits that the thick disk is very much part of and the outer edge of the thin disk is part of. So we know okay, it's so all, we know it's from a low metallicity star, but the the, the, the term thick disk uh, maybe doesn't quite apply to it. It's on the boundary. Oh, it's on the boundary. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I almost never hear anybody mention the thick disk and I've been doing this for almost 50 years. <laughs> So <laughs> it's not a term that people use very often, but okay. So, but if it is a low metallicity, and again, when astronomers speak of metals, they're not talking about like, you know, actual metals as we think of them on earth, but they're just talking about elements that were made inside stars. Uh, this one is low metallicity, which means that it must be older. Yeah. It has and so how old, how old is it? Oh, so our statistical method takes this velocity, it takes the known correlation between stars, ages, and their velocities, and um, work, works out a confidence interval. We can't say an exact age, but we can say a range of ages that are likely. And our range says it's between 7.5 billion years old. Oh, wow. That's old. The sun is four and a half billion years old. <laughs> Awesome. That is so cool. So it's more than half again the age of our sun. Yeah. And that's a lower limit. Our, the, our range stretches from that to the highest age we considered. Uh, wow. Is, wow. So okay. it could feasibly be twice as old as the solar system. Um, the sun is about halfway through its life. If it formed around a sun-like star, there's a reasonable chance that the sun, the star that it formed around has now died and is gone. Oh, oh, okay. And so is that uh, an idea that fits into how it might have escaped and started traveling through space and ended up in our solar system that perhaps its, Maybe. its own star died? So we think most interstellar objects uh, are ejected from their planetary systems very early on because planet formation is messy. And while the giant planets form, they move around. Stars form in star clusters where and passing star can fly really close by and pull planetesimals away. But there is also an idea that they might get released at the end of a star's life, because as the star dies, it, releases, it loses its mass. So anything that's only weakly bound, suddenly the gravity, the very weak gravity that was holding them there is gone and it'll drift away slowly. 
So as the star ends its life, it loses its mass and it just sort of lets go of all of these comets that it previously held in orbit. And so that would mean that there might be billions of these comets flying around in the Milky Way galaxy. We can estimate the number because we know the density of ISOs around the sun uh, from the detect previous detections. And that number is 10 to the 15 per cubic parsec, oh which my is gosh. an absurd number. The it density is. of stars is about 0 0.1 per cubic parsec. So oh my gosh. 16 <laughs> orders of magnitude between the stars and the ISOs density. <laughs> wow. Okay. At one point we, just... we extrapolated that to the rest of the Milky Way, um, and we got something like 10 to the 27 in total across the entire galaxy. <laughs> wow. So, so here's the question everybody wants to know. Why are we just now seeing these things? Why are we just now seeing objects like uh, 3i Atlas and 2i so tell... Boris F and, and Oumuamua? And why are we just now spotting those? <laughs> So they are everywhere with this massive density that I said, but they're difficult to spot because they move, they're small and dim, but telescopes have been getting better all the time. The computer systems that analyze the images as well have been getting better all the time. And that's a big thing, the detection of one eye and three eye. Um, they need to be like, the images are automatically scanned. And this trend is gonna continue. Uh, later this year, the Vera C. Rubin Observatory is gonna start a, a big survey called the LSST, the Legacy Survey in Space and Time. And our, uh, my group as well that I work with uh, are predicting that that's going to find between five and 50 over the next 10 years. And given that we only have three currently, that's a massive increase and we're really excited for that. That's going to be so exciting. I hope that happens. Me too. Wow. The <laughs> discovery of 3i before that survey even starts as well puts us on the optimist again for that. So we're hoping for 50. That's so cool. So let's go back to talking about the object itself. Um, so as comets approach the sun, uh, sunlight heats their surfaces and triggers activity. For example, mm -hmm. comet tails. Uh, yeah. And early observations already suggest that this comet is active. It's not super close to the sun yet. First, tell us how far away is it from the sun at this point? I think it's just within the orbit of Jupiter right now. Um, I'm on its way and I can't remember the exact number. Okay, okay. But we're already seeing activity. So I think I have an image of that. Hold on, there we go. Yeah. It does almost look like there's a little bit of fuzziness around mm -hmm. this object extending off to the right. Is that what you see or am I making that yeah, up? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this and other images as well are showing that there is a bit of fuzz around it, which is like a screen of uh, dust that it's managed to eject off its surface. Okay. And so what are the implications of that? I mean, does that mean it's a big object? It, so we know that it's bright. In astronomy, all we can see is the light that something reflects to us. Uh, so we know that it's bright. We can't really put a size on it yet. Um, and we won't until it gets closer. And we can start to do clever things like try and actually resolve the little nugget of ice that's at the center of this cloud. Um, uh, we can't quite put a size on it yet, but we will hopefully soon. Okay, because we just talked about a comet. We had someone in here last week talking about a comet that was 85 miles across. Yeah. And so that's very different from when mm -hmm. I first started talking about astronomy in the 1970s because comets were thought to be maybe, you know, six miles across. And now we've yeah. got comets that are way, way bigger than that. So there's um, a, a distribution of sizes. There's, there are big objects out there, but they're a lot rarer. Uh, this is probably a, one of the more common small objects, I think. Okay. Um, and this object is not coming anywhere near us, correct? Nope. <laughs> um, so the, the blue line here is its path. Yeah, uh, it will clip just inside the orbit of Mars as it, at its closest approach to the sun. But actually, by the time it reaches that point, the Earth will have continued around on its orbit uh, anti-clockwise in this uh, plot. And we'll actually be on the other side of the sun when that happens. So we won't get a great view of its exact perihelion, but we should get a really good view just before and just after. Okay. And are we going to get that really good view from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter? 
Is it going Maybe. to be able to be used? Is it possible? I don't know. That's uh, completely outside of my field, but it's an idea that I've heard, and it sounds really cool. Get the space I mean, I, up on Mars to point at it. We just heard recently that they were using the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, that they had flipped it completely over. They did like a 180 turn with it. So they, they have some maneuverability for that oh, nice. orbiter. <laughs> yeah. So that, that just happened a week or so ago that, that they were... Uh, using you know using the spacecraft in a different way so that would be cool so we could cool, get an yeah. image of it from that because that that spacecraft around mars has produced some amazing images of mars wow wouldn't mm -hmm. that be wonderful i bet the team never envisaged you know pointing it away from mars at something else <laughs> especially not cool. at something like this yeah <laughs> yeah okay that is so great okay so and we are not going to be able to see it with the eye from earth it's not coming anywhere near earth correct i it's at perihelion no i have heard that it might be visible to uh small amateur telescopes just before and just after perihelion when it's still okay high, but not to the naked eye no that'll be exciting so we'll get yeah, a lot yeah. of images of it if that happens mm. it'll be really and cool to actually see this piece of another solar system kind of th through a telescope Hopefully, it's accessible to other people. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, do we know in what direction it's going from here? I mean, it looks from this chart like we do know. Do we know if it's going towards some other star? Uh, we pretty well uh, know this orbit is pretty well constrained now. Um, but it'll continue on this line, bend slightly as it passes the sun, and then continue out. Uh, it probably will not hit another star for many, many billions of years, though. Uh, we know uh, from our calculations that actually an ob object, it's pretty rare for an object to get this close to any star. Um, between interactions like this, the time scale is about 10 to the 5 billion, hang on, I'm trying to learn uh, normal person numbers, uh, <laughs> 10 to the 14 years, which is a huge, absurdly large number. Um, most ISOs never get this close to a sun. We're seeing a very small fraction of them. Wow. We are so lucky to see this. And it's such yeah. an exciting event. And we're so grateful to you for coming to speak with us today. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. And if you uh, learn anything super exciting, drop us a note. We'll have you come back. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Um, we are Earth Sky, and we're here live every weekday starting around midday in North America. Uh, tomorrow, we'll be talking about a live cam that'll be streaming the annual migration of 57,000 beluga whales as they journey through the Hudson Bay to feed, molt, and give birth. We hope you'll join us then. One Earth, one Sky, Earth Sky.